Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome on behalf of the Collaborative Learning Cafe. We are very happy to have with us this evening Johan da Silva, who works in stock trading and equity research. He is also the finance club head at bluelearn.in. Johan founded a leadership group in Goa called the Dream Team Alliance and is currently also working on building a platform for artists and creative people in Goa itself called Get Creative Goa. He is working towards building a financially literate India through his work. He has a BCom honors in finance and is currently pursuing his MCom in finance. Over to you, Johan. Thank you so much for accepting the invite to present and speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frederick. And uh, thank you, especially to the Jesuits for having me and for uh, for giving me this platform to, to express this topic. Most importantly, I would say that I'm really glad to have a small group for, for once and a group that I can really, uh, you know, focus on extensively in terms of special Q&A at the end. So any questions we'll keep for the end. So without further ado, let me just present my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, this is a this is a very um, this is a very sensitive topic and an extremely important topic and it's it's something that's it's really unfortunate that this has not been taught to us at a young age and something that was not being taught to us in school especially. So you know um, what happens with this uh, with what happens with the stock markets is it's a it's a place that's ever changing. So you will never find a, a time period where you will have the same things occurring. You may have similar trends, but you may not have the same situations and circumstances. So the stock market keeps reacting to these different factors and these different circumstances. So now what happens is to start with, let us bust some myths about investing. So the first thing that you will most commonly hear is investing is gambling. Now what happens here is we have to first understand what exactly is gambling. So now when you when we look at uh, when we look at environments and events around us where you know uh, where we'd compare gambling uh, stock uh, stock gambling to would be uh, probably the casinos or probably these card games and things like this. Now why are these why are these games and why are these casinos called gambling? It's very simplistically because the result and the the occurrence of of the result from these events is simplistically from luck it is not something that we can forecast it is not something that we can you know look at certain factors and say that this is what my outcome will be like it is it just comes from one factor which is luck and what happens as a result of this is that um, that we we tend to call stock markets also gambling because uh, what happens with stock with stocks is that we buy stocks without understanding how a company works, how the economy works and things like that. So just because we know someone who's in, who's investing or trading in stocks, we often for, try to follow their footsteps. We try to make money out of it. And, uh, and usually the, the result is not something that may move in our favor and we end up calling it gambling, but that's not often the case. Now, the second thing is an FD. So what is an FD? An FD is simply a fixed deposit. Now, what happens with fixed deposits is in today's world, very unfortunately, uh, you know, in the post COVID world, the inflation. So now let, let me let us understand these two things. So number one is inflation eats away our money. And how, is, how does that happen is that you might have noticed, especially for all for all of the people here who are born probably before the year, uh, like I'm born in the year 1999. So Probably uh, many of you who are born before that might remember that a samosa or uh, probably chips or things like that would cost, would not even cost you a rupee, it would probably be in paisas back then. But today, if you see the price of a chips packet or a samosa and things like that, it's tw nearly 20 rupees. And back then, 20 rupees was a lot of money, but today it doesn't hold that much of value. And this is, this is uh, the, the result of this is coming from one factor, which is called inflation. So inflation uh, basically erodes the value of money. 
Now what happens here is that today, uh, an FD rate would probably be on average somewhere around six point, maybe six point one two percent or so on average. And what happens with inflation is inflation had touched a had touched nearly six point four to six point five percent. So what happens here is our return on an FD has become lower than the has become lower than the inflation rate. So in other words, the money that we have in an FD is becoming negative. So if you notice, an FD cannot be called an investment because an investment, the definition of investment is something that brings us money into our pocket. It is something that helps beat the inflation rate, which today an FD is failing to do. And as a result of this, what is happening is today, many of you might have seen that the stock market has reached, has reached, uh, you can say the moon, because what ha what has happened is uh, our economy has not you know, has not recovered to an extent that the stock market is, uh, you know, giving us that image. So why is this happening is because an FD return has become negative today and multiple families are breaking the FDs and moving that money into the stock market. So now the question is, is this a good thing or not? Now, I would personally say that I do not believe this is a good thing. Because what happens is an FD has become uh, in India has become this security for a family so we usually put money that you know that we are we really value this money that we really need that we have worked hard for we end we end up putting that money into fds so when you break that money and you shove it in the market for a quick gain or you know a return over time what happens is we are putting that money that we value that security of ours we are putting it in a place that is extremely risky and right enough what happens is that every fall there will be a stronger fall because people, you know, when, when I say, if I am, if say if I'm running a household, if I'm having a family and if I put that FD money into the stock market, I will constantly be looking at that money because that is the uh, probably money that I've saved for my family to look after my family. And what happens is when the stock market starts falling and when I see that money of mine in, you know, starting to enter the negative zone, I would rush to sell that amount and I'd rush to get that amount out of the market out of fear that I will lose that money. And what happens as a result of this is multiple families around the country, around the state and everywhere end up rushing to sell that amount. And this triggers a further sell off than what there already is. So this is causing this is causing extremely, uh, you know, a, a very fast boost of the stock market. And it's also causing a large amount of panic in, in you know, when the market falls. So if you look at the past three, three, four days, the market has fallen and this is triggering this panic emotion and this emotion of fear. So in the stock market also, what happens is you have emotions that end up, you know, that end up taking over us. And today only 2% of the population makes money. And there's only one thing that defines them. It is the fact that they can keep their emotions aside and make logical decisions. So let us, let us understand this, you know, all of these phenomenons further. So now when we look at the third point, we look at the fact that, you know, many of these people around us, they do not end up buying these value valuable companies, but what they do is they spend a lot of time, a lot of money buying these penny stocks. So now let us understand what are penny stocks. Penny stocks are uh, in simple terms. They are these stocks that cost 10, 15, 20 rupees or so. So they are these stocks that everybody can afford and now let us understand a very simple uh, economic concept or an economic, uh, what do you call it, equation in the stock market. So now when we look at valuable companies, right? So if we look at companies that have lasted and that have done extremely well over the past 20, 25, 30 years, there are stocks like, for example, an Asian Paints, or you look at a Reliance, you look at, uh, you look at a Pedalite Industries, you look at uh, probably uh, an HUL or a Dabur, so these are companies that have been there for the past 20, 25, 30 years and have done extremely well. They have rewarded their investors with a lot of money, especially those who have been patient enough to wait for all those years. And what happens with, you know, what happens with these stocks is you have to keep one thing in mind. They have survived the past 30 years. They have experienced drastic changes in terms of technology, in terms of the economy around them and everything. And they have still made it through with fantastic ret returns. So what makes you think that they will not do this, the same in the next 20, 25 years? This is what I keep telling people around me is that if a company has done it in the past, 
a company will continue to do it in the future because they have understood the world around them very well. And what happens with penny stocks and the uh, you know stocks like these is that these companies have not been there for a long time. They've just been there for three, four, or maybe even less number of years. And as a result of this, what happens is these companies lack experience and they do not know how to grow and create wealth for their investors. So what happens is you often see these companies just disappearing after a period of three to four years. And when they disappear, what they disappear with is also your hard earned money. So you have to keep these things in mind. Now, let us understand why these penny stocks do not grow up to that level. Why these penny stocks don't grow up to that level is uh, to, to cut a long story short is today when I buy, right? So, so what are the two factors that drive a stock? It is demand and supply. When someone keeps buying a stock that drives the price up because the value increases, because there's a lot of demand for it. Now, at the same time, what drives the stock down is when there's a lot of selling, when people stop valuing that stock. So what happens here is that uh, you, when you look at a Reliance, you look at a nation page, these are stocks that are at 3000 rupees because people have driven it up to that level. And what happens is when it comes to penny stocks, people are not pumping in that kind of money to be pushing it up to that level. So what, what is happening here? Let us understand what's happening here is that when we look at an Asian pains reliance, why are so many people, so many people around the country, around the world buying these stocks? It's because they have a lot of value. It's because they're strong companies and they're, they're performing really well. And that is why everybody runs to push their money there. But the opposite happens with penny stocks. These companies, people are not seeing value in these companies. And so people are not buying the stocks and the stocks are not moving up. And this is, this is something that we have to understand that just because the stock is cheap, doesn't make it a good investment. And if I, you know, if I were to give you an example, um, let me give you an example of, of two stocks that, um, one second, let me prove my statement with, with the help of an example. Let me present my screen again. So, so um, now let us look at a penny stock to start with. So there is a stock called Vodafone idea, for example. Now what happens with this stock? Let us look at the past couple of years to understand. So now if we look at this stock, uh, one second, let me just refresh it. So now if we look at this stock, for example, Vodafone idea, we have, uh, wait, let me just use a different platform to be easier to understand. So now if we look at, if we look at this stock, right, if we look at Vodafone idea, right from a time period of, let us say, yeah. So let us say we're looking at this time period, which is, which is here. So this is, this takes us back to 2015. So this is now five years in the past, or if we want, let us look back, let us look back even further to understand. So let us look back at 2007, right? So now 2007 is many years ago. Now what happens here is if you look at the price here, it was at 145 rupees. Now, if you look at compare it to Reliance, okay. If you look at Reliance it to, in 2007, so that would be somewhere back here. Let me take you further. Yeah. So we have 2007. 
so if you look at reliance in 2007 it was at 427 rupees so if you notice it was nearly four times the price of vodafone idea but what has the result been over the years today vodafone idea is at nine rupees from a price of 144 which is nearly 90 something percent down in other words for every 100 rupees that you invested in this stock you'd be left with only some something like three or four rupees that is how much this how much of value this company has lost over time not only for itself but for investors as well now if we look at a reliance in 2007 for example over here so we're talking about 427 rupees today look at the value today it's at 2351 so if we want to understand what is this percentage that we have earned we're looking at Let me just take this up. We're looking at 455%. In other words, for every 100 rupees that you invested, you'd be left with nearly 456 400, to, to 460 uh, rupees with you. So you can imagine how much of wealth this company has created for its shareholders. So, so this, is, this is my point being that do penny stocks really create value? That is a big question mark. Now, let us understand the next, uh, you know, the modern trends in today's, what is happening in today's world. So we have three major things. We have cryptocurrency that is emerging. In, in fact, if you look at the news recently, you'll see this whole, uh, the all of these headlines stating that India wants to ban cryptocurrency and things like that. So this cryptocurrency has emerged uh, very recently from, uh, it, it, to be honest, to support the, te the, the tech industry. Now what is happening in cryptocurrency is like the stock market. What happens is in the stock market, we can look at the fundamental factors. We can look at how a company has performed. We can look at its profit and loss account. We can look at its uh, balance sheet. We can look at the products of a company. And with that, we can judge where the company could probably go 10 to 15 years from now. But with this cryptocurrency that has emerged, it is purely speculative. It, this is cryptocurrency is what I would call gambling. It is not, there's nothing that I can look at that can help me decide and help me understand or see uh, where the company could go or where this currency could go 10 to 15 years down the line. So this is the uh, cryptocurrency has become this whole debate today where people are asking, is it really worth, uh, you know, uh, venturing into this cryptocurrency as they call it. Secondly, you have to keep in mind that this is not regulated by the government or by the central banks. So what happens is you never know where your money is going tomorrow, where it's going to come from, nothing of that sort. Now, the second thing is you have these startups. So when you look at Zomato, you look at uh, a Paytm or things like that. You have these startups that are not making any profit on their statements, yet they're valued in billions of dollars. So what is happening today is companies have lost their value and investors have lost that logic of looking at underlying statements and judging the, the company's value. So uh, what happens is when we look at startups today, these companies that have just emerged looking to solve problems today, they're valuing themselves based on the number of users they have under them. So Zomato, for example, will say I have three to 4 million people under me. And so my valuation, my value would be based on that, based on the assumption that tomorrow I could charge each of them, maybe if you are 500, 600 rupees, and that would translate into revenue for my company. So again, it's based on an assumption. There's no facts. Now, when we look at companies today, when we look at companies that have evolved over a period of time, their companies have had profits and revenues on their statements. So there are underlying facts to prove that their position. But in startups, that is not there is no revenue today. There are only losses. So how do we judge these companies? It's a big question mark. And the last thing is social media. As you know, the, the age of information and technology is just changing the way we look at things. And, um, you know, as they say that, Today, it's no longer about the closest three friends you hang around with, but it's more about the closest three people that you follow very closely on social media. This has become a trend today. And what is happening is social media is creating this fake image, this fake impression that, that you know, the stock market is a place where you can, you can make millions of dollars or, and you can, or you can buy a Lamborghini in three years, or you can buy a mansion in four years. But the stock market takes a lot of hard work 
and it takes a lot of dedication to make money. There are people who have waited for 30, 40 to 50 years in order to buy their first car also. So we have to, you know, understand where this, uh, this false uh, information and this false influence is stemming from. And we need to keep our distance away from it. Now, when we look at when we look at the pros of the stock market, so the first thing is it outperforms inflation. So when we look at the past, what has happened is the stock market has delivered consistently around 12%. And on average, the inflation in India has been somewhere on average around 4 points, uh, I think around 4.8% it is. So if you see uh, the stock market has, you know, outperformed inflation by a huge margin, which means that if you are someone who has been investing in the stock market over a period of time, you your money has not lost value. Your money has gained a tremendous amount of value and you have created a lot of wealth for yourself. The second thing is invest to fit your circumstances. So as you know, all of us come from different in, uh, environments, different uh, backgrounds, different cultures. And so the way we look at money, the way we earn money, it's entirely different from one another. So what happens is over here in the stock market is we can fit these circumstances to our investment decisions. So if we are risk takers, for example, we can take more, we can invest in companies that are highly, you know, that have a lot of risk on with them. But when, if you are, if you are people who are very conservative, then what happens is we can invest in companies that are, that, you know, take very low risk or may take longer to achieve their returns and things like that. So we can invest to fit our circumstances. Now, the next thing is you can avail of benefits directly from the company. So over a period of time, the companies have not only given, uh, you know, returns to the shareholders, but who have also given other benefits. So you have companies, for example, who have given, like if you look at Indian hotels, for example, so Indian hotels is the company that owns all the Taj hotels in India. Now they have given, they, uh, you know, have given coupons to their shareholders where the uh, shareholders can go and have a meal with their family and avail of a 25% discount, for example. So these are, uh, you know, the company ends up giving shareholders various benefits that keep the shareholders happy. Then the next thing is liquidity. So unlike if you look at an FD, for example, you're, you're investing in an FD for say probably three, four, five years and your money is locked in over there. But what happens in the stock market is tomorrow, if you want to sell your stocks, you can just sell it within few seconds. So it's highly liquid. You can get the money out uh, as fast as you put it in. And the last thing is dividends and ownership rights. So certainly many of us growing up wanted to be owners of companies. And if you, you know, if you understand the stock market, you will understand that the stock market gives you ownership rights to the company. So you are not just someone who's owning a share in the company. You are called an owner of that company. So it's a, it's, it brings, you know, especially when you hold a good company, when you're owning a good company, it brings a tremendous amount of uh, prestige to your portfolio because you're someone who's holding valuable companies and over and above that the company also pays you a good amount of dividends so uh, over a period of time for example if i uh, put 100 rupees in a company and if a company pays 10 rupees dividend uh, say every every uh, every six months what will happen is over a period of five years your investment becomes zero because you have retrieved all the money back right that you've put in and what happens as a result of this is over uh, beyond those five years, every return that you earn becomes free of cost because you have invested basically nothing in that company, whatever you've invested, you've already got back. So everything that you earn beyond that point becomes free. And this is how people like Warren Buffett created value for themselves. Now, when we look at the cons of the stock market, there is only one major con, which is the risk of capital erosion. So as you, you know, if you look at the example that I showed you, if you're someone who doesn't understand the stock market, you don't know how to pick a good company. You may, or, uh, you may end up investing your money in companies like Vodafone Idea, which may cause erosion of your money over time. So your hard-earned money will be will have absolutely no value tomorrow. And this is the major con of the stock market is that if you do not know how to pick the right company, how to put your money in the right place, then you will end up losing your money. And that, that can be a huge downfall and a very big discouraging factor for you. But in reality, what's happening is it's not that the stock market is a bad place or a gamble. In reality, it's just that you haven't understood the stock market entirely and you haven't understood really how to pick a good company. So this is something that you have to understand. Now, a few key points to remember. Now, if we, if we look at a few secrets of the trade, 
now these are things that people may not really share with you but uh, i will i will i will help you understand these things so the first thing is you have to understand that there's an inverse relationship between gold and the market so what happens is if you look at the nifty today the indian stock market there is an inverse relationship in other words whenever the stock market goes up gold will fall whenever gold goes up you'll see the stock market rising so how do you how do you manage yourself between these two how you could very commonly manage yourself between these two is when you feel the stock market is highly overvalued you can begin to book your profits and switch to gold because you know that when the stock market starts falling you'll have people who start rushing towards gold and that is when you'll make a good gain from it so this is something that you have to understand the next thing is a positive relationship between the us markets and indian markets so over the long term the indian market and the us market has moved along with one another and so what happens is we have to we have to be able to forecast where the us market is heading and that would help us probably also or partially judge where the indian market is moving so you have to also understand that the us market is a developed country whereas the indian market is a developing country and so what happens is our uh, our markets may be much more volatile as compared to the us markets and last is uh, uh, sorry second last is cagr is the most powerful force in the universe so what is cagr very simplistically stands for compounded annual growth rate now this is something um, like let me open an excel sheet to help you understand that so when we look at uh, let us understand two things one is cagr and one is when we put our money into probably some other you know some any other source say we buy uh, say an nft for example since many of you will be able to relate now what happens is let us assume that we have put in 1000 rupees now what happens with uh, nf so let us assume that a return that we are earning is 6% okay now cagr tells me that over years we are looking at year 1 2 3 4 5 5 what happens with 1000 rupees at 6% is so when you open a calculator you want to understand cagr understand the percentage you are looking for then put 1000 plus 6% okay so that give will give you 60 so now what happens is over here is this 6% is added to your principal so 1000 it becomes 1000 Plus six percent. So if I, you know, if you open your calculator, you you get. So as I showed you, you get sixty, right? So this becomes thousand plus sixty, which gives you thousand sixty. Now in year two, it will not become thousand plus six percent. It will become thousand sixty plus six percent. So what happens is you will end up getting one one. Two three. Now again, six percent is added on the one one two three. So that gives you one one nine one. So if you notice, let us take only till year three. So what happens here is in an FD, you earn six percent on the principal. So this becomes again thousand sixteen year one. In year two also it becomes thousand sixteen year three also thousand sixty. So what happens over here is if you notice your total return. at the end of year 3 your your investment would be at 1191 but your uh, your earnings from your fd would be at 1060 only so this is something that we have to understand about cagr and the difference between any other alternative and this is something that einstein called the most powerful force in the universe because he said that when you invest in in the in the long term what happens is your money keeps compounding your returns keep growing on your principal plus profit it does not become just principal plus uh, profit principal plus profit principal plus profit it becomes principal plus profit over and above that profit over and above that profit and so what happens is the larger the more you invest the more your capital begins to grow at larger amounts of money and this is how people who have become extremely rich in the market have created wealth for themselves and warren buffett for example had has achieved a cagr of 26% and that is how an investment of 10000 dollars became uh, today something like 81 to 91 billion dollars so this is how this is the power of cagr and the last thing that you need to keep in mind is uh, risk to reward should be 1 is to 3 now what happens if you look at the market today it's at a peak 
So this means that the risk is three to a reward of one. In other words, the risk that we're taking is much higher than the reward because the chances of it going up higher is lesser than the chances of it falling, right? So the, from this point onwards, a correction is long overdue. And so we know that it's bound to happen at some point in time. And so the risk is highly against us. So we have to keep one thing in mind is that uh, if you look at the bottom, so if you look at the stock market here, right? If I take the index. So if we see here when this COVID crash happened, okay, so somewhere around here it was. If you notice the market was at a bottom. So what happens when the market is at a bottom is that the risk is in our favor because the chances of it going up are very high from this point onwards. Whereas when we look at the market today, which is over here, the chances of it falling are very high. So the risk is against us. So in other words, we have to keep this ratio in mind in order to take high, you know, extreme advantage of our, uh, of the market and how to win in the market. So when the, when, you know, when the risk to reward ratio, that is for every one rupee we earn, we get a three rupee reward, or we could potentially earn a three rupee reward. That is the point at which we need to invest. But the inverse is also true, which means that when the risk is three and the chances of a reward is only one, then that is a, that is a cue to exit the market and to save our money. So this is one more thing we have to keep in mind. And coming to the final part is that that we have to understand the difference between good investments and bad investments. So uh, these are these are some of the key things that you need to keep in mind is number one is good fundamentals. So how do we judge fundamentals are by looking at profit and loss by looking at a balance sheet and by looking at these statements. So let me let me give an example. I'll, I'll open a company and show you how we could so you could open this site called screeners. It would give you a, it, it gives you the fundamentals of any company that you may search for. So for example, if we go to the profit and loss account, if we look at a reliance, you'll, you'll see there's a tremendous amount of uh, profit that this company is achieving, you know, over the period of time. And also, if you look at their reserves on their balance sheet, tremendous amount of reserves every year is growing by a huge amount of money. So this shows that a company is doing really well because it's creating a lot of wealth for itself. And this, what happens is these reserves can tomorrow be used to expand the business and to further grow. So this, this is how, you know, how we judge a good company. Now, when we look here at poor fundamentals, let us understand what are poor fundamentals. So when we look at Vodafone idea again, as we looked at it, first of all, look at the Look at this profit and loss position. It is in a huge loss, this company. And to make matters worse, the reserves are in negative. And look at the amount of loans that this company has on its statement. The loans are increasing and the company is not making a profit. Neither is it having a reserve. So what is happening is this company is just digging its grave. And as investors, we have to understand that these are, these are, these are the kind of companies that we have to keep our distance from. Now, again, if you look at the price, it's only eight or nine rupees. It's highly affordable, but does it make sense? Is it logical to enter a company like this? That is a big, that is a big question you have to ask yourself. But when you look at a company like, let us say Asian Paints, for example, if I take another example, if you look at Asian Paints, also the price is about 3000 and something rupees as of today, but look at the net profit, how it's growing over time. Then look at the loan position and look at the reserves. The reserves are 12 times the loan position. So these are, these are examples of fabulous companies because they know how to create wealth and they have done so over a period of time. So this is something, this is how we judge the fundamentals of a company. Now, the next thing is good management and poor management. So also the people who manage the, the company are extremely important because they are the ones who allocate the money. So when you as a shareholder gives your money to a company, the management is the one who decides where that comp that money needs to be invested. And so it's extremely important to have a good management behind the company because if a company ends up, you know, in, uh, putting that money in the wrong places, then that will lead to erosion of wealth and that will not help you gain wealth over a period of time. Now, the next thing is good past returns. So as we saw that we need to look at the past returns of a company 
and only if it makes sense only if it's good if it has performed well over a period of time can we safely say that over the next couple of years this company can also create wealth because they have the experience to do so the opposite is true for bad investments again low debt and high debt now why do i say low debt is preferable for an investment is because very um, is because what happens is when i have low debt on my statements and if i'm still doing well as a company tomorrow if i do need a loan the bank will not hesitate to give me that because i haven't had any loans and i've still done well and another perspective to look at it is also when i have low debt means that i have absolutely no interest expense that i'm spending and so my profit of my statements are higher and so i can achieve a higher amount of profit which can tomorrow help me expand my business better so this is why i prefer companies that have low debt on their statements again the opposite is true for bad investments now when when we talk about less fii manipulation high fii manipulation what are fii's fii's are foreign institutional investors these are people who manipulate the market this is something that nobody will tell you but you have to be you have to keep a sharp eye on this and this is something that i will help you understand today so when we look at we look at uh, uh the let us let, let us understand where to find this data so if you go on money control okay so this is a website that is commonly used by investors and if we go scroll down to this portion you will find fii dii stats so just click on this now what happens is you will you will find this information over here this gives me so if you look at fii this gives me all the information of the foreign institutional investors how they've been reacting in the past couple of days so now to support my statement why do we have to understand these fii's and how they are reacting to the market is because they are the ones who control the market today so to prove my statement can you see in the past 1 2 3 4 5 days there has only been selling and by a large amount of money you are talking about 3000 3000 crores 4000 crores 5000 crores daily now let us look at the index okay so if we look at the past 4 5 days can you see this huge selling that has happened over the past 4 5 days so look at this there has been selling so can you see the amount of influence these people are having on the market so if we, if i give you an individual stock as an example is indian railways you will notice right so if you see here can you see so this is the average volume of the stock that has been traded over a period of time but if you look here you'll see huge volumes which means that this there are a lot of lot of money that is coming and going out of the stock and people like you and me cannot have this kind of influence on the stock it is only people with a lot of money people with 4 5000 crores 6000 crores and foreign institutional investors are the only people who have that kind of money so if you notice you can see manipulation here in this in this stock so if we see here it started somewhere around here the manipulation so if you see here the stock shot up 9% intraday which is a it's a huge jump for a stock and if you notice in the the foreign institutional investors have driven the stock up see how much and what has happened is over a period of time people like you and me have started entering the stock because probably some uncle or auntie of ours had entered the stock here and started making huge amount of money and so we we do not want to miss out on this potential gain and so we also end up entering the stock out of that desperation to make the money but what happens is we by the time we come to know about the stock we would be somewhere here so we end up buying the stock here hoping to make a return right enough we do make a return but what happens is in this at this point we see are we have already made uh, you know how much so we entered here we have already made 22% which is a good gain in a period of 4 5 days and so what we say is let me continue to hold the stock but what happens is can you see this huge selling here again foreign institutional investors have done this because you can look at the volumes to judge that and what has happened as a result of that is can you see the stock has collapsed 38% and now we have entered here we are in a loss of nearly 18% or so and so we have lost eight uh, for every 100 rupees we have invested we are losing 18 rupees 
So this is something that we have to keep in mind that, you know, today for any stock that you look at, always keep track of the volumes to understand whether there's manipulation happening or not. This is something that nobody will tell you, but this is something that I'm sharing with you today because this is something that will help you protect your, your money. Now, the next thing that you need to look at is good return on investment and return on capital employed. Why are these two things extremely important is because Return on investment tells you that for every rupee you're investing, what is the return that you're earning on that rupee? And so it has to be a good return. If if for every 100 rupee uh, you're investing, if you're earning just something like one or two rupees, it doesn't make sense. But when you're earning something like 18 or 19 percent, so that would be like uh, 19 or uh, uh, 19, 20 rupees, then that makes sense to invest, right? Because no other avenue in the stock market, uh, sorry, no other avenue in the economy is giving you that kind of return. So th this is why a good return on investment and return on capital employed is extremely important. And the uh, opposite is also true, which means that a low ROI and a low return on capital employed also doesn't make sense to venture into. And again, a good product portfolio. So when you have, uh, if, so if you look at Asian paints, for example, they have a very good product portfolio. The paints are of extremely good quality. The pricing is also extremely good, which is highly affordable when someone wants to pick up, or, you know, or wants to buy paints. So a good product, good quality products and a good price is extremely important to push a company's growth. The opposite is also true for bad investments. So when you have products that are lacking in terms of quality, then the pricing is extremely high. Then these become unfavorable for customers. And what happens when it becomes unfavorable for customers? It, it becomes a it becomes an issue for a company because these uh, when customers do not buy a product, it does not translate to revenues for that company. And so that is where a company suffers. Now, the next thing is good macroeconomics. So macroeconomics are basically economics. So economics that are related to a company are called microeconomics. And economics that are related to the economy where a company functions in are called macroeconomics. And so what happens is good macroeconomics are extremely important. So if you look at things like the demand in the economy, the inflation in the economy, the interest rates in the economy. These are macro factors and these are factors that should be supporting the, the company. So even tax, tax, a tax structure or, you know, taxation policies are very important because tomorrow if a company. So, for example, if you look at the recent recent trends, now the, comp, the government has come up with a, with policies saying that they want India to move into an EV revolution of, you know, electric vehicles. And so what is happening is they are providing subsidies and benefits to all companies who are manufacturing electric vehicles. And this is boosting these companies because what is happening is their expenses are reducing. And so their profits can be increased as a result, right? And also what is happening is it is driving with lower taxes or no taxes on those products. Customers also are moving towards buying those products because it's becoming cheaper to buy those products. And these are things that help boost these companies. And so this is why it's important to understand the macroeconomics behind a company. And the next thing is strong economic mode. So what is economic mode? Let us understand. Uh, let me show you a diagram to help you understand what is an economic mode. So. So if we look at an economic mode, um, and it much better. So when we look at an economic mode, the mode is basically the water that surrounds the castle. So similarly over here, the castle is the company. The water is your protection and the attackers is your competition. So what happens is the economic moat is basically the advantage that a company has, which protects its, its sales and its revenues and its profits. For example, let me give an example. So if you look at the auto sector, right? If you look at Maruti Suzuki, they, it's very hard for other car companies to come even close to Maruti Suzuki. Where, why is that? It's because Maruti Suzuki has a very strong service network in even the most rural parts of the country. And so what happens uh, uh, over here is they have built this over a period of time and this is translated to the companies to become the comp company's advantage. So competitors find it very hard to position themselves in such a manner. And what happens as a result of this is 
consumers, people like you and me, prefer to choose Maruti Suzuki because of its quality service. So that is that becomes the advantage of the company. So when we look at some of the best companies today who have created value over time, they are companies who have had this economic moat with them. They are companies who have created this value for themselves by building an advantage for themselves. So this is something that we have to identify when we pick a good investment. It should be a company that has a very strong economic moat. Bad investments again have no economic moat because again, what happens is these companies have no advantage, and so consumers will choose their competitors over them because they have not they didn't have that defining factor that uh, you know convinces me as a consumer that okay, this is a product that I need to choose because it is better than the rest. They do not have that that uh, you know that advantage over their competitors. And last is significant market share and small market share. So what happens is again. Uh, a company that has a very high market share already has a large number of consumers going to them, and so when I, as a small company, come up as a competitor, it is very hard for me to beat this company, because what happens is this company already has established itself in such a strong manner, and so it is very hard for me to beat this company. And very often you will see a strong relation between strong economic moat and market share. So a company that has built a strong economic moat over a period of time has often been a company that has Managed to achieve a high market share as a result of this. So this is something that go. Th these are two factors that go hand in hand with one another, and the opposite is also true for bad investments. So when companies have not managed to make an economic moat, they haven't managed to keep their customers happy for a long period of time, and so customers have often switched between competitors. And what has happened is these companies have lost their market share as a result. So this is some. These are these are how you pick. You know a, uh, how you define a good investment from a bad one. And finally, we have uh, a quote from uh, the Wizard of o Omaha, that is Warren Buffett: "Successful investing takes time, discipline, and patience." So if you really want to win in the market, it's not just about picking a good company, but it's about believing in that company and sticking by that company. And being uh, being patient and waiting for that company to give you the returns that you truly deserve for the patience that you practice. So yeah, with that, I'm done with my session, and I'm open for questions. You have a few questions in the chat box. In the chat box. Okay, yeah. Okay, can you explain what exactly is an SIP systematic systematic investment plan and how does it work? Is it profitable? Okay, so so in the markets you have to understand that you have two kinds of investors. You have investors who put their money into, you know, directly into the into the market. So these are people who are very confident of themselves of their decisions. So they often end up buying stocks directly. So if I want to, uh, if I have hundred rupees today and I want to pick up three stocks, I may probably put a foundation paints or Pedalite Industries or a Dabur. But what happens is you also have the second set of investors who do not know how to pick. Good companies, and what happens as a result is, we often, uh, you know, put this money, uh, trust our money to professionals. And these professionals are mutual funds. So, are professionals who handle, uh, you know, all these, uh, all the capital that invest to them, and they uh, will take that capital and put it into into the market, into different different avenues based on the policy. So, what happens is, if I invest in a large cap mutual fund, they will not put your money into into small caps or mid caps or these small and mid companies. They will put them only in big companies. Because the policy states that you're supposed to invest your money only with big companies, and you can only take a certain X amount of risk. And so this is what happens when it comes to mutual funds. Can you hear? Can you hear me clearly now? Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better. It's breaking a bit, but it's better. It's better. We 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 can follow you. Okay. Just uh, give, give me one second. Let me switch my internet. Give me exactly one second. Take your time.
okay is it clear now yeah yeah perfect perfect okay great so okay yeah so now uh, coming back to sips so sips give give investors the uh, especially people who are earning salaries it gives them the facility to invest a portion of their salary every month in into the stock market and what happens is it does not directly go into the stock market it goes to this mutual fund and this fund manager then decides where he should allocate the money based on the companies that seem undervalued at that point in time so what happens is sips are highly beneficial for you know people who are earning salaries to start with and also for people who don't know how to invest so what happens is a portion of a salary goes every month and it goes to people who are extremely experienced and who have a license to uh, to invest that money so you can you can expect a great deal of security from that as well now um, the next question in the chat is Okay, how are how are penny stocks valued as low as rupees ten? So again, uh, coming back to uh, coming back to that slide, what happens is penny stocks do not have do not hold a lot of value with them, and what happens as a result of this is uh, people do not uh, when people don't see the value in something, they do not put their money there. So very simplistically, when some when a company starts gaining a lot of value, a large number of people start putting their money there. and the demand drives the price up but what happens with penny stocks is there is no value to start with and so people do not put their money there and as a result that that doesn't reflect in the price because the price and the money the sorry the price of the stock never starts rallying and what happens with uh, is uh, youngsters especially people like me we do not have uh, a lot of money to start off with we are people who you know when we have a, a, a little bit of pocket money we may not be able to to buy a, a large number of shares of reliance or asian paints or companies like these and as a result of that what happens is we often search for stocks that that are affordable but what happens is stocks that are affordable are not always the best picks and this is something that we as youngsters need to understand and um, what happens with penny stocks is like i said they are really cheap they they can uh, you know they can be valued at probably 10 8 rupees or even 1 rupee but they do not have value in them and so over a period of time you may not see capital appreciation and you may not see wealth creation for yourself so this is something that you have to be very careful of and you have to understand this now the next thing is uh will there be a follow up talk on advanced investing from a layman perspective is some that would help in understanding measuring picking companies better yeah i would uh, yeah i i would be happy to do this session in fact if if you know um, if the jesuits want me to come back i'd most certainly be happy to take a advanced session where i could really go into depth of how to uh, how to look at the fundamentals and how to read the charts and things like that and uh, yeah next question is what is the minimum amount to invest in shares in the market for the first time so it's a very good question this is a question that is very commonly asked by many people now when you when you ask the question of what is the minimum amount like i said penny stocks are valued at 10 rupees so that could be the minimum amount that you know you have to invest in shares but what happens is the question is are you picking something valuable so today why is why is a mercedes uh, costing you 40 50 lakhs it's because of the luxury that you get with it right it's because of the value that it holds or forget a mercedes let us look at diamonds why are diamonds today worth crores of rupees it's because of the value that it holds and so this is something that we have to understand that the minimum amount to invest could be 1 2 or even 50 paisa but the question is are you getting value at that 50 paisa and so this is something that you have to first you know begin by identifying a valuable investment and then turn that into your minimum amount of, to invest even if you're picking one share at 3000 rupees that could provide much more value than picking probably uh, you know 1000 shares at 3 rupees so you have to be very uh, very smart and very logical in this regard okay she's 
okay please tell us something about blue learn the dream team alliance and yeah okay so um, so I, i'm currently a 22 year old um, 22 year old kid you can say or ad- adult whatever you wish to call it now what happened is um, how did blue learn come about is I've, i i started investing at the age of 16 so when i was uh, 16 when i just finished my uh, 11th standard i had started investing in the stock markets so now it's been somewhere around uh, around f- around 5 years and something since i've been in the stock market and what has happened is over a period of time i kept asking myself a question as to you know what is it that uh why is it that people of my age are not starting at a young age why are people of my age not investing money why are people only waiting for the age of 30 40 50 to start investing because it, it you know this is something that made no sense to me and what happened is as a result of that i started undertaking a lot of research so i i spent like the last uh, probably 8 to 9 months of research you know trying to understand why this is not happening and i i understood that there was only one factor at play here and that was simply because um people it's not that people of my age don't have money it's just that people of my age lack the education and understanding as to how the stock market works and that is why they don't don't invest their money and what happened is i then came up uh, i you know i derived my conclusion i came to the conclusion that uh, education is the one factor that is lacking which is why people don't invest their money not just youngsters but even adults is simply because they do not understand how the stock market works and how to pick the right investments and things like that and so what happens is um uh, once i derived that uh, conclusion i uh, started uh, you know i started looking creating opportunities for myself and th- this startup called blue learn which has been in uh, you know into this into the education space for the past one year already they are bangalore based So what has happened is this startup uh, approached me and asked me to uh, head their finance club. So under the under their company, they have various they have various clubs, and these clubs uh, uh, suit various purposes. So for example, if they have an uh, if they have a music club, it is only meant for musicians to help musicians develop themselves as individuals. And so what happened is they uh, came up with the uh, they asked me to head their finance club to basically promote. financial education and financial literacy mainly among the youth because uh, you might have uh, you might have realized amongst uh, family members and friends that the younger you invest the better are your chances of making and creating wealth for yourself over a period of time so this is something that's very important is that uh, if you look at warren buffett also for that matter he started investing at the age of 10 and he bought uh, one of his first stocks was coca cola which today has is earning him millions in terms of just dividends so you can imagine uh, the amount of potential that this holds so uh, so yeah so basically at blue learn i'm heading the finance club and uh, we are uh, we are focusing on uh, financial literacy and helping people understand uh, investments and how to pick good investments so and over and above that also psychology so these are things that uh, you know we are working at blue learn now the next thing is the dream team alliance is something i founded in uh, back in 2018 so i started with uh, with around 5 to 6 people in fact it was just close friends and that group i had founded because i i started it as this sort of self development group where i would send resources or you know i would help uh, we as friends would basically help one another develop ourselves and build our characters so we would send links to talks uh, or we would send uh, books to read or you know probably podcasts and things like that and we would follow up with one another so we once we uh, you know listen to a talk or read a book we uh, then discuss that particular aspect what we learned from it and things like that and what happened is i never imagined it in fact to really scale but today it has gone up to uh, nearly 200 uh, people in that group and it's become a group where we're not only uh, you know like minded people but we are a group where there be, there are various people who have who have joined the group and there are people who from different careers professions and experiences and they send all of these uh, resources where i'm not only learning things about my field in my area but i'm i've ended up learning things about medicine about fitness about nutrition and about 
probably about biochemicals and what not so it's become a it's become a space where there's a tremendous amount of learning not only from your field but you're learning things from other areas as well and also it's become a group where people are now sharing resources which are extremely critical so in fact if someone may just come to me and ask me you know say for example i need xyz i just put a message on the group and within 10 minutes i get a response as to where i could probably find xyz or if anyone has xyz already with them so it becomes extremely efficient for me not just to gain resources but to also help people around me so that is what the dream team alliance has become today and the third platform is uh, for artists and creative people so again uh there is this um, there is this guy called Vince Costa from uh, from uh, the south and what happens is he is the guy who founded get creative goa and what has happened is he has created uh, get creative goa to be a platform where all of these uh, home bakers all of these artists all of these musicians and you know basically anyone in the creative space can basically come and register themselves on that platform and what happens is on this platform uh he provides opportunities to them to basically perform to sell their art and things like that and what has happened is my role at get creative goa is i'm not just helping him uh, sort of uh, you know build this uh, platform but my role moreover is to help these artists and help these uh, creative people understand how to manage their finances most importantly because what happens is see, even today if you you may be the best doctor or you may be the best uh, whatever scientist if you do not know how to manage your money at the end of the day then it makes it it's of no use because if uh, you know if i earn 2 lakhs a month for example and if i just go out and blow it somewhere then that has not uh, done any good to my life but at the same time if i know how to convert that 2 lakhs to 10 lakhs in the future then that is something that will not only bring security to my life but it will help me live a better life for myself as well and so this is a this is a sort of purpose that i found in this industry and at get creative goa what happens is all of these artists and all of these professionals in the creative space they do not understand how to manage their money and so what has happened is at get creative goa i will be playing this role where i'll be helping these people understand how to manage their money how to invest their money as you know as artists and professionals in that creative space now uh, yeah the next question how do you know when companies cook up accounts so um uh, uh, so to answer this question what happens is it's very hard to understand you know when companies cook up their accounts because what happens uh, and this is precisely why i tell people to stay away from small companies because see when i'm a company that has 100 or 200 or 300 branches across the country so if you look at a mutual finance or a bajaj finance we have hundreds of offices across the country it is very hard for me to go to each office and shift those accounts or modify those accounts or you know manipulate those accounts but what happens when i'm a small company with only two or three offices in the country i can go to each i have enough time and uh, enough patience to go to each office and manipulate those accounts and this is another thing you have to keep in mind is that penny stocks often end up uh, in into you know financial scams and disasters because it is much easier to manipulate accounts over there but what happens is when you are a very well established company there is uh, you do not have the time you do not have the patience and there is you do not have the opportunities most importantly to go out and uh, you know manipulate your accounts and so this is uh, to to judge uh, to understand uh, when a company cooks up accounts is very difficult but what happens is when you are when you stick by big companies well established companies you can be sure that those companies would not only uh, you know will not only find it very difficult to cook up their accounts but it will be close to impossible for them to do so because they do not have the opportunities to do so so yeah that would be my answer to that question how to calculate the actual value of a share or how to check if a share is overvalued so um, you have this very common metric called the price to earnings ratio now this is a very commonly used ratio in the industry where uh, you know people check the price to the earnings now what happens with this metric is it's not entirely accurate because even uh, let me give an example for it. so currently there's this company that you know i've been looking at it's called iul chemicals so now ideally what happens is when you look at a pe ratio um when a pe ratio is below 15 this is undervalued 
when it's between 15 to 20, they say it's fairly overvalued or fairly valued. And when it's, you know, above 20, they say it's overvalued. Now what happens is you may find that this may not be always true because now if I look at IUL chemicals, the stock P is nine. So now that tells me that, you know, it should be, uh, it tells me that it should be, uh, what do you call it? Undervalued, right? But what happens over here is that it's not only important to look at a stock P in isolation, but we have to understand why is the stock P that low? So now when we look at a company like IUL Chemicals, they manufacture this product called ibuprofen. Now ibuprofen is a raw material that uh, forms about 70% of many tablets that you consume on a daily basis, especially those who have heart problems or diabetes and things like that. Ibuprofen forms 70% of the raw materials of that particular tablet. And so what happens is also another thing is IUL Chemicals as a company, they uh, have this sort of mon monopoly in terms of ibuprofen because they are the only people and the largest uh, players of manufacture of ibuprofen. But now you will ask me if this company is such a good company, why is it not reflecting as much in the price? Now, what is happening with this company is ibuprofen. So, so you have tablets. Now, ibuprofen forms a raw material of tablets. Now, there are raw materials which are used to manufacture ibuprofen. Now, what happens is these raw materials, raw material prices are extremely volatile. And this affects the margins and the returns of the company. And as a result of that, what happens is ibuprofen as a company also becomes very volatile because the performance of the company is volatile. And so it's not, and so my point being is that it's not only important to look at the P ratio, it's important to look at also why the P ratio is that low. It's very important to understand these things. Now, when we look at calculating the actual value, there is unfortunately not one, uh, you know, not one uh, right way to calculate the value of a, of a company. And so what is extremely important is to combine the fundamentals of a company. So that is the financial statements of a company along with the charts. So what is the price action of the company telling you? So you have to compare both of these things and then decide what is the, what is the, uh, you know, the fair value of that, of that company. So uh, there is no one right way to judge the value of a company, but what you can do is wait for the wait for good corrections in good companies and pick those companies up at those times, because uh, to cut a long story short, let's say that when there is panic, that is when you should be buying. And when there is a uh, sort of uh, this extremely uh, euphoric moments, that is when you should be booking a profit and getting out. So I would say that these are things that you have to keep in mind when you want to pick the right share. There are, you know, there are various complex methods also that are used like discounting cash flow and all, but we're sort of running short on time. So we, would, we could probably keep that for the advanced uh, session later on. How easy would it be to sell if I needed my money right away? Uh, so one thing that I always tell my friends is, uh, and the people around me is never in invest money that you need in the market. The reason is because of course, see, obviously every rupee that you put in the market is money that you need only at the end of the day. But my point being never invest money that you need instantly or, you know, money that, uh, where the need would arise for any emergency or things like that. My reasoning is because if you invest at a particular price and if say there's some, there's some, let us say a terrorist attack or an, or, you know, some natural disaster, which could cause the share price to crash. You wouldn't want to be in a position where you would have to sell your, your stock at a loss in order to take that money to pay off your emergency or your expense. And so you need to, you know, when you, when you earn your salary or when you earn a income, Keep that portion of money that you would never want to look at for the next 10 to 15 years and pick a good company and put that money over there and don't look at it for the next 10 to 15 years. Because what happens is in the short term, you never know what can happen. But in the long term, these companies will eventually recover as the cycles turn, as the, you know, uh, as the aftermath of the disaster cools down and things like that. So uh, my advice over here would be never, you know, never invest money that you need. And as a result of that, you would not come to a position where you would have to uh, sell instantly at a loss in order to get that money right away. So that is that is something that uh, you can keep in mind.
what is uh, news that there will be a market crash uh, i'm not i'm not getting the exact question over here uh, vance if you could please uh, elaborate a bit further i would be able to address this better and then we have how can we join hello? the dream team hello hello, hello? i'm yeah, actually my yeah, question yeah. was i was checking online actually and okay. then they were saying that uh, correction correction the crash could be uh, okay. could, there could be a crash because many of the stocks are overvalued correct. correct so that's why my question is like you know how can can the crash be predicted or is it just like okay. mere speculation okay so uh, let let me bring a few things into perspective over here um so to start with when you talk about a crash it is very hard to forecast exactly when a crash can happen so because again like i explained to you it is the foreign investors who control the market today so what happens is when valuations in foreign countries become uh, attractive these foreign investors pull out their market from india and move it abroad and what happens is then our markets begin to crash so when they is these investors will do it is a very hard uh, answer to give for this question but how you can better position yourself let me tell you like things that i do personally in especially a situation like today now what happens is yes a crash seems inevitable at this point in time so what i have done is i have sold all of you know all of these small and uh, mid sized companies and i moved more into larger well established companies because the chance because the foreign in uh, you know foreign investor involvement is less in these larger companies and more in the smaller mid mid cap companies and so what happens is when this crash does come these larger companies will be less affected than the small and uh, you know mid sized companies and so what happens is you need to manage your risk in that manner when you know that a crash seems inevitable at this point you need to start moving your funds into safer avenues so there are people who are also moving their money out of the stock market so that is in one option but if you are someone who wants to stick by the stock market then you need to you know stick by the larger well established companies in order to protect your money so this is uh, i hope this answers your question so again again to bring one more one more thing into perspective is also you have to keep in mind that uh, i would say that you know when when a good crash could be triggered is uh, when the us markets when say joe biden comes tomorrow and says uh, that we are going to increase the interest rates in our economy what happens is then is uh, if i am a foreign investor investing in india which is a developing country and is relatively risky compared to a developed country what happens is i will pull my money out of india right because it won't make sense anymore to me i would rather put my money in the united states which is a developed country where i'm now earning a better return and at a much lower risk so what is happening is that would make more sense to me right that seems more attractive so i pull all my money out from india and i put it there and this is what other foreign investors do as well and collectively this can cause a crash in the market so this is something that you know you have to pay close attention to and you need to position yourself in a way where your risk is well managed um yeah next thing is how can we join the dream team alliance uh so what so yeah so what i'll do is in fact i will i will share the link uh yeah i'll, I'll give in fact if you like give me 2 minutes i could share my please hold on i'll i'll be back in like few seconds Yeah, so what actually yeah what i will do is i will share that uh, the whatsapp group link uh, with with you guys so what i can do is i'll leave my my contact number here so you can just like uh, whatsapp me and i'll share the invite link with you so i put my i put my number in the chat section so you can get in touch with me and i'll share the link with you um yeah next question is
Okay, is intraday trading better for beginners? Uh, I would say no, because what happens is intraday is the most, uh, you know, it has the highest amount of risk in terms of, uh, in terms of trading. And so for beginners, I would not recommend intraday until you really understand how the stock market works, how, how to judge a good company and things like that. So um, my recommendation would be to first, you know, to first understand how long term works, then coming down to a midterm, coming down to a short term. And last, what you should be going into is intraday. Once you've understood how the, you know, how everything at every level works. So intraday should be the last thing you should be looking at as a beginner because it has the highest amount of risk. So that would be my answer to that question. Uh, yeah, any any other questions so far? In the meantime, what I can do is I can get you the link of a LinkedIn group. Okay, don't you think that SIP will allow us to average the high and low of the market? Uh, definitely. So in in uh, what happens is with an SIP is it will be going from a salary on the monthly basis at different periods of time. So as a result of that, what will happen is it will help you. It will definitely help you average the high and low of the market because your money would be going in at high uh, when the market is high and when the market is low. And so what will happen is you'll be, you'll, uh, you know, you'll manage to achieve an average over there. So your risk will be well managed. And of course, at the end of the day, there's a professional who's handling your money. So that is another thing that can bring a great deal of comfort to a, to a person who's just starting off in the market. Trying to get the link for Johan the Creative Goa link for Instagram I've shared. It's it's uh, Creative Goa on Instagram. Correct, correct, yes. And Lulan dot is yes. also there for, for young people. Correct. Yes, it's the it's the yeah, you've got you've got it right over there. In fact, I've I've also got like an I've got an Instagram page. In fact, that I'm that I'm uh, I can share that link as well. Give me a second. So from this yeah, Instagram please. page, I've basically started this Instagram page to to educate youngsters on uh, you know different uh, uh, different components and different theories and things about the stock market. So it's it, it all contains very basic information. So I'll share that link as well. You can have a look at that. Yeah, so so a beginner will have to first start with opening a DMAT account, and uh, your PAN number is compulsory, definitely, because it's all linked to your. At the end of the day, all the money that you receive and the money that you put out is all linked to your PAN number, and that is how the government tracks where your money is coming from and where it's going. So I'm also going to be putting the link of that page in the in the chat. So I put the uh, link of the page that I the page that I had started, uh, which which also uh, which also has been acquired by BlueLearn. In fact, they have taken over my account, but I'm still running the account. So it's owned by them, but. Uh, but I'm running the account. So you can have a look at that, look at that as well. And in terms of the Dream Team Alliance, I'm just trying to get you that link.
okay actually the thing is my the group is full and that is why that is why i uh, so what you, what you can do is y'all can uh, put down the, your contact numbers maybe of you know all of those who want to join that group and i could i could add you guys there what is your advice for senior citizens who would like to invest in the stock markets okay uh so for senior citizens who would like to invest i would i would first say that you know uh, if you look at age groups as a factor to 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 decide where to invest our money what happens is with when it comes to youngsters we we have a lot of time ahead of us so as a result of that we can take increased risk also because in case we lose that money we have time to build or uh, you know to uh, to make more money because see if i take high risk and my age and if i lose that money by chance what happens is i don't have a family and stuff depending on me right now and so as a result of that what happens is uh, i can then you know take up a job and stuff and recover the money that i lost now when it comes to senior citizens they are highly dependent on their savings because they can no longer work for their money and so what happens is they are uh, savings today are how they sustain themselves and uh, you know all their medical expenses and things like that would also arise and so what uh, so when it comes to senior citizens uh, i would say that they should probably be in you in probably be in stocks with very low risk and things that probably give consistent returns and uh, most importantly they should try and be in stocks which uh, you know give dividends for example because what happens is that would be a regular source of income for you which would, which could help sustain all your expenses so i think that would be my answer to that question i'll also take the pictures of the people who want to join the group i can share you all these uh, chats later on if you want to like okay, i get okay. it as a text file okay done so yeah any more questions if if not then uh, could we wind up because we are almost on time yes we are almost winding on time <laughs> two minutes two, yeah yeah uh, those two minutes should go in thanking johan uh, de silva <laughs> for being such a uh, engrossing speaker keeping us all interested and what i like best apart from uh, the interesting aspects of his talk were the manner in which he told us that he was just 22 years old somewhere in the middle <laughs> of his talk and uh, of course i i yes. i'm not uh, you know the oldest donkey is not the wisest donkey at all <laughs> but uh, but we really value youth and it's so nice to see young people entering different fields and of course clc is there to to take talks on all on a wide range of subjects we are totally neutral to whatever the topic is and i'll also urge others to come forward and volunteer some talk thank you so much i think elliot is raising a hand if he if if anyone at this stage wants to raise a hand say something but i'll finish the thank yous just to uh, jo johan and to the entire clc team for putting this together particularly savio and and uh, father mervin and everyone else all the volunteers thank you thank you so much and yeah. of course as usual uh, we announce all the programs on the collaborative learning cafe.org website and uh, there are mentions made also uh, on on the friends of the jesuits in goa uh, whatsapp group and also uh, facebook facebook there are some uh, and of course all our talks are recorded and they are on our youtube page thank you so yeah. much thanks thanks at nan johan for all all yeah. the patience and and the excellent talk that you shared with us thank you thank you so much thank you everyone good night See good you. night everybody bye bye